Good morning. It is the second Sunday of Epiphany. This is our service of morning prayer for today. I'm Daniel Atkinson from St. Thomas Anglican Church. Uh, if you'd like to get a service bulletin to follow along and participate this morning, you can get it from our website, stacathens.org. Uh, there's also information if you'd like to join a Zoom meeting and participate in community uh, for this morning prayer service. That's stacathens.org. You can find that bulletin, or if you have a prayer book, you can use that and follow along this morning. Uh, morning prayer begins on page 11 of the 2019 Book of Common Prayer, and we begin with a seasonal uh, opening sentence. From the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense will be offered to my name, and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Turning to page 12, let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no help in us. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare all those who confess their faults. Restore all those who are penitent, according to your promises declare to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of his Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I continue with the invitatory. O oh Lord, open our lips. Our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. The Lord has shown forth his glory. O come, let us adore him.
shown forth his glory. O come, let us adore him. Let's continue in our songs of praise. We're going to sing, Be Thou My Vision, in the place of our song reading. from 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Now the young man, Samuel, was ministering to the Lord under Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There were no frequent visions. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. The Lord, then the Lord called to Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli, and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lie down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the young man. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood, calling as other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house 
from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, here I am. And Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what, he, what seems good to him. And Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that, knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. Here ends the reading. gospel lesson today is from the gospel according to John, beginning in the first chapter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael also and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. And Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Here ends the reading. Okay. 
Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you, O Lord, are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. You can be seated if you're here and standing. Um, there's an old saying that good things come in pairs. Now, some attribute it to an old Chinese proverb about double happiness from traditional marriage celebrations where the emphasis is on the significance of pairs and the double happiness they can bring to one another and to their families. We find this rhythm, this balance of good things come in pairs all over the Bible. From the very beginning when God created the heavens and the earth, day and night, the man and the woman. Uh, UGA football fans remember, of course, Nick Chubb and Sony Michelle. Good things come in pairs. In Genesis 3, sin enters the story of the Bible, resulting in discord between pairs, division instead of harmony. And so you quickly see that instead of balanced pairs, Adam and Eve argue. Cain murders Abel. Jacob and Esau cannot stand each other. And when we turn to the gospel lessons during Epiphany, one thing you'll notice is that in and through Jesus, once again, good things come in pairs. It's a clear hint that in Christ, God is restoring everything to the way it was supposed to be. In our passage this morning, and we begin to look at the calling of the first disciples. And here, good things come in pairs for sure. Uh, today, we'll look at one of these pairs, Philip and Nathaniel. Um, next week, our reading will actually feature Simon Peter and Andrew. And so today, we're going to look at the calling of this pair of disciples. And we'll see a double mission that results in double vision. And to understand this vision, we need to unpack what Jesus is saying when he tells Nathanael in the Gospel of John, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. So if you have a Bible or you can see it there in the bulletin, turn with me to John 1, verses 43 through 46, the first part of our passage. We're going to see this double mission. Um, and the double mission of this passage, John 1, 43 through 46, is seen in two invitations, very simple. Follow me, come and see. Follow me, come and see. First, follow me. We start with the conversion of Philip. It's actually extraordinary. A man's life changes in one verse, two at most. John writes in verse 43, the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Verse 44 tells us, now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. This is on the north end of the Sea of Galilee. And what we see is, and the question is, who is actually on mission in this passage? Who finds Philip? Jesus. Uh, when it comes to the mission of God, uh, when it comes to kingdom work, when it comes to evangelism, Jesus is the leader. Jesus is the pioneer. He's the one out in front doing the most work. And for Philip here, his call is specific, it's personal, and it's all-encompassing. Follow me. Now, another question as we look at this passage, why are we told that Philip is from the same town as Andrew and Peter? Is John just trying to show off here, add some detail? I think the implication is Andrew and Peter had told Jesus about Philip. Some of these things come in a little bit uh, different order um, in our Epiphany lectionary readings as they do in the Gospels. Um, in the Gospel of John, Jesus has already called Peter and Andrew. And I think they then told Jesus, hey, you've got to let our friend know. You've got to let Philip know about this. And again, some assume that the mission and kingdom work, evangelism, are about awkward, unwelcome pressure to go talk with your friends and family about Jesus, maybe to trick them or argue them into the faith. But I think as we see here, maybe the first step is to talk to Jesus about our friends and family, like Andrew and Peter, I think, did here in John 1. In other words, put them on your prayer list. Start praying for them. See what kind of opportunities may present themselves. 
And in here, what's amazing is the mission of Jesus now becomes Philip's mission too. And that's a key part of what it means to follow him. It's not weird or awkward or forced. As Philip begins following Jesus, he naturally and quickly begins telling people about this epiphany he has had in the person of Jesus. Verses 45 through 46, he goes to find Nathanael, telling him with excitement and urgency, we have found him. Who? Him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Philip's invitation to Nathanael meets him where he is. We get the sense that Nathanael is a man of faith. He's a student of Israel's scriptures. He's waiting on God to fulfill his promises. Um, and I would say there's many people we know just like him. Uh, religious, devout folks um, who may even know some things about religion. Uh, they might have some Bible stories from childhood or, or in their lives, but they need to encounter the living word of God. Uh, the word who became flesh, Jesus Christ. And you'll notice that Nathaniel's response is skeptical. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Are you kidding? Nazareth was uh, nowheresville. And, and think about it. We, we all know that there are some places and some people that unfortunately we look down our noses at. If we live in one of those places, we might even look for um, another worse place to look down on. I think that's why uh, here in Georgia, there's so many jokes about Alabama. <laughs> At least there's something uh, lower on the totem pole. You get the idea. Nazareth was one of those kind of places. Um, Tim Keller, uh, who pastored for, for years in Manhattan, uh, illustrated it once this way. He says that Nazareth uh, was dueling banjos country. <laughs> we get the point. Um, and don't miss us. All of that is true. Nazareth was nowheresville. It's dueling banjos country. Yet, this is where God chose to send his son. This is where Jesus, the word made flesh, was raised in nowheresville among a bunch of nobodies for us and for our salvation. Um, Tim Keller again puts it this way. When God came into the world, he came not as a philosopher or a general, but as a carpenter, a blue-collar worker, born to a poor family in a nowhere place. Nathaniel's question about Nazareth should remind us of the utter humility of God. And we learn a lot from Philip's response. Man, when you're talking with someone about Jesus who may be skeptical, even a religious person who doesn't know why you're so excited in the first place, um, consider Philip's approach. Philip doesn't waste time defending his message or arguing with Nathaniel. He simply makes an invitation. Come and see. Yeah, I, I, I get that you have questions. I get that this is confusing. Come and see. Come and see what you think. And, and there will be people in your life that require prayer. There will be some who need discussion and time. And many will simply need to come and see. And Nathaniel is at least curious enough to tag along. I hope the Lord, even in this weird COVID-19 season, is showing you who, like Philip, you need to be talking to God about, and who, like Nathaniel, you need to prayerfully invite to come and see. All right, let's see what happens as this double mission becomes this double vision. John 1, verses 47 through 51. As Philip and Nathanael uh, approach, John focuses on what Jesus sees, on, on his vision of and for Nathanael. Jesus sees him and, and greets him with wonderful words of encouragement. Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. And by the way, there's some interesting wordplay going on. Israel, of course, is the name of the nation. But in the Old Testament, Israel is also a name. It was the name given to Jacob, who was the king of deceit, when we read the Old Testament. And that's going to become very important in a few verses. Nathaniel's taken aback. He's there investigating Philip's claims about Jesus, and Jesus seems to know all about it. Jesus said, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. I saw you. Jesus saw Philip, and Jesus sees you. Jesus sees me. He knows us better than we know ourselves. <laughs> Philip, I love this. Philip's surprised and jumps to the right to the end of the story. Rabbi, you are the son of God. 
You're the king of Israel. Incredible. Uh, and I think that actually Nathaniel was so hopeful that Philip might have been right, that it really was the one they had been waiting for. It didn't take much to push him from doubt to faith. And I imagine Jesus chuckling a little bit at his eagerness, his enthusiasm, being like, man, you haven't seen anything yet, but you will. Verse 51 is incredibly significant. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus starts with, I saw you, and he moves to, you will see. And all of this goes back to the patriarch Israel, who I mentioned, who was also uh, named Jacob, one of our pairs, whose relationship with his twin brother Esau was marked by deceit and discord and division. Um, you see, this vision of the angels of God ascending and descending isn't random. Jacob, Israel, had the very same vision all the way back in Genesis chapter 28. Um, Jacob, Israel, was on the run. Uh, he had tricked his brother Esau. He had stolen his birthright. Esau is chasing him. Jacob is desperate. We're told he finally lays down to sleep using a rock for his pillow. What a desperate, pitiful scene. Sleeping with your head on a rock on the run from your very own brother who you've betrayed and tricked. But that night, he has a dream. Genesis chapter 28, verse 12 says, And he, Jacob, dreamed. And behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. <laughs> By the way, the word ladder is not, you know, a little step ladder in your house. Um, it's a giant ladder, this grand ramp. This word referred to a massive structure that actually allowed armies to cross bodies of water and mountainsides. In other words, Jesus, Jacob, saw an army of angels ascending and descending from heaven to earth. And God was and is doing business on earth. The Lord of hosts is on the move. And there in Genesis 28, we read that then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God and this is the gate of heaven. Bishop N.T. Wright points out that in this passage, Jacob called the place Bethel, that is God's house. And that place became one of the great sanctuaries in all of Israel in the Old Testament. And the tradition of Jacob's dream, of the angels going up and down on the ladder, uh, would then be connected with the belief that when you worship God in his house, God was present with his angels coming and going, linking heaven and earth. That's probably the clue we're looking for here. A great deal of John's gospel has to do with the way in which Jesus fulfills the prophecies made concerning the temple and also goes beyond them, pioneering a new way in which the living God will be with his people. What you'll see from now on is the reality towards which Jacob's ladder and even the temple itself pointed like a signpost. If you follow me, is what Jesus is telling these men, you'll be watching what it looks like when heaven and earth are open to each other, when heaven and earth have come together. The point of this double mission, this double vision, is that in and through Jesus, heaven and earth are open to one another. This means, friends, that we can experience the presence of God today in our worship, in our mission, in our lives as God floods everything starting with us with his glory, his goodness, his light. We are called to experience that mission in our own lives and to be part of the mission to help the Phillips and help the Nathaniels in our lives, see it as well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's continue together as we affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. If you're using your Book of Common Prayer, we're on page 20. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. 
I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. With your spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show your mercy upon us. Grant us your salvation. O Lord, guide those who govern us, and lead us in the way of justice and truth. Clothe your ministers with righteousness, and let your people sing with joy. O Lord, save your people, and bless your inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, and defend us by your mighty power. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and take not your Holy Spirit from us. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, is the light of the world, grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. O God, our King, by the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, on the first day of the week, you conquered sin, put death to flight, and gave us the hope of everlasting life. Redeem all our days by this victory. Forgive our sins, banish our fears, Make us bold to praise you and to do your will, and steal us to wait for the consummation of your kingdom on the last great day, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross, that everyone might come within reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you for the honor of your name. Amen. Amen. We'll now have a time of silent prayer. Uh, where, um, wherever you're watching this, you can take a moment to offer your thanksgivings and intercessions to the Lord. As we continue in a time of prayer, our Archbishop and Bishop uh, Holy Beach has asked that we would spend some time praying uh, for uh, our country, uh, praying for safety with uh, the inauguration coming up this week. And so as the people of God, I want to lead us through um, a litany for our time. It's a litany that was written by one of our bishops, Bishop Stuart Ruff, that we can pray uh, for our country. Good and gracious Lord, we come before you as a nation divided. We pray you to hear our prayer, even as we cry, Lord, have mercy. Forgive us for any idols we have made of politics or people. Lord, have mercy. Save us from all sin and any grip of the evil one. Lord, have mercy. Turn our hearts to submit fully to the Lord and kingdom of heaven. Lord, have mercy. 
thwart the enemy's efforts to deepen discord and hatred in our country and cause division in our churches. Lord, have, have mercy. mercy. Strengthen and preserve the democratic institutions of our nation and help us engage in our political process with truth and love. Lord, have, have mercy. mercy. Guide our country in a peaceful transfer of power. Lord, have mercy. Provide holy wisdom and clear direction to all church and civic leaders. Lord, have mercy. Comfort those who are mourning. Lord, have mercy. Restore us, good Lord, and grant the gifts we need to serve you now. Lord, have mercy. Pour out your peace and prophetic insight to equip us as your agents of kingdom goodness in our world. Lord, have mercy. Heavenly Father, you promise to hear what we ask in the name of your Son. Accept and fulfill our petitions, we pray, not as we ask in our ignorance, nor as we deserve in our sinfulness, but as you know and love us in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Um, a few parish announcements before we close this morning. Um, first of all, um, thank you for, for tuning in. We know that uh, this is a unique time, that this is not ideal, but thank you for those participating, um, either uh, directly through our live stream or those of you who are on the Zoom meeting participating in community. We're grateful for you. I'm grateful that you're tracking with us. and it's, it's a privilege to lead you in worship this morning. Um, we have a few things coming up in the life of our parish. Um, in early February, uh, our Archbishop and Bishop Foley Beach is going to be visiting. We'll have uh, baptisms and confirmations. Those will look a little different uh, because of this online streaming medium. But if you haven't uh, already, let me know if you'd like to be confirmed um, or if you're interested in baptism for you or if you're a parent interested in baptism for your child. Uh, we need to go ahead and get those uh finalized and ready to go at this point. That's the first Sunday of February that Archbishop Beach will be with us. Um, the next February, uh, week, Sunday in February, the 14th, um, you may know it as Valentine's Day. We don't. It is Sunday. Um, and we will have worship and we'll actually have our annual meeting. Uh, looking back at this crazy year we've had, looking ahead into some of the unknown of 2021 together. Um, one of the things we'll do during our annual meeting is elect new vestry members. Uh, we don't have anyone rotating off vestry yet, but we have new vestry members coming on. So uh, nominations uh, are open right now. You can nominate someone to serve on our vestry. Uh, this is a group of lay folks who uh, help out and serve looking at the temporal, the financial matters of the parish. Uh, they take counsel with me. They pray for you and for our church. And so if you know someone who is a member and who's confirmed, even if they're getting confirmed on the 7th, um, and you'd like to nominate them for vestry, please uh, reach out to me about that via email, daniel at stacathens.org. Uh, and then uh, be praying for us. We're, we're looking at plans for February, March, April, looking at Lent, Holy Week, Easter, all these things coming uh, fast and furious. We want to make sure um, that we can uh, do what we can to gather and we can gather safely. And that may be indoors, outdoors. We're not sure. But be praying for us as we make these decisions and be praying for our communities um, in the public health situation, um, that, that folks would stay well, that our medical facilities um, would be able to care for those who, who need care. Uh, we give thanks for the vaccine and, and those even in our parish who are letting me know they've got their first round, they're scheduled for their second round. Um, and I think we know that it's tricky right now, but we're starting to see um, kind of a post-pandemic reality in sight. So all that's going on right now, uh, do let us know if you need prayer, if you'd like a pastoral visit with communion elements while we're meeting online. Um, we do give thanks for the ongoing financial generosity of our church. Thanks for the gifts that have been given uh, over this past week. Thank you for gifts that you're going to give today. And you can make a gift online on our website, stacathens.org. Uh, mindful of that, let's sing uh, an offertory hymn, uh, and then we'll close our service together. Oh. Uh -huh. 
page 26 as we conclude our service of morning prayer. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. You have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Our services ended. Have a great week. See you later.